All right, get ready, because we're diving deep into DeepSeek V3. DeepSeek V3, huh? Sounds exciting. It is. Well, I think so. Anyway, it's a new large language model, and it's been making some waves. I bet. So what are we looking at today? You sent over some pretty intense excerpts from their research paper, right? I did. And I need your help to break it all down. No problem. I love this stuff. Okay, good. So DeepSeek V3 is all about efficiency and power. Efficiency and power, two very good things. Especially when it comes to code and math. And I know you're a code whiz. I do love a good algorithm. But there are a lot of new large language models out there, right? What makes DeepSeq V3 so special? Yeah, that's a good point. It seems like there's a new one every week. Exactly. So why is this one worth a deep dive? Well, for starters, it's open source. Open source, okay. That means researchers, developers, even just hobbyists can access it, tinker with it, you know, build on it. So not locked away in some tech company's secret lab. Exactly. Which is huge for the AI community. More people can experiment, more innovation. It's a good thing. Yeah, I see that. So accessibility is a big plus. But this model is also packed with all these innovations, right? Uh, oh, yeah. It's not just about being open. They've done some really clever things under the hood. Okay, let's lift the hood then. The paper mentions something called a mixture of experts or MOE architecture. Ah, yes, MOE. Very cool stuff. Break it down for me. What is that? Imagine a team of, like, specialists. The specialists. Each one is incredible at a specific task, but... They work together seamlessly. Okay, I'm kind of with you. That's basically the MOE approach. You have all these expert modules, each focused on a particular thing. So not just one giant AI brain trying to do everything at once. Nope. It's more like a well-coordinated team, which makes it way more efficient. And DeepSeek V3 has a lot of experts, right? Something like 671 billion parameters. That's right. A massive capacity. But here's the kicker. Only about 37 billion are active at any given time. So it's got all this power on tap, but it's only using what it needs. That's wild. Exactly. That's a big part of why it's so efficient to train. Yeah. And they even used FP8 for training. FP8. Now we're getting into the technical jargon. It's just a way of representing numbers in a computer. Okay. But FD8 is super efficient. I got it. It means they used less computing power, less energy to train this massive model. So MOE and FP8 are what make... DeepSeek V3 so efficient. They're a big part of it. And it's not just about saving money. It means that more researchers can actually work with these powerful models. So more breakthroughs on the horizon. That's exciting. Exactly. More brains on the problem, the better. Okay. But I have to ask, if DeepSeek V3 has all these specialized experts, how do they make sure they're all, you know, actually working? No slacking off in the AI break room. That is a great question. They use what's called an auxiliary loss-free strategy for load balancing. Auxiliary loss-free, okay. You can think of it like a really good project manager making sure everyone is contributing and nobody is getting overloaded. So no AI burnout. Exactly. And this load balancing strategy is really important for making sure no single expert becomes a bottleneck and slows the whole system down. So they're all in sync, working together efficiently. You got it. Okay, so we've covered how it manages all its experts. The paper also mentioned something called multi-token prediction, or MTP. MTT. Now that's where it gets really interesting. Lay it on me. Most language models predict one word at a time, right? Right. DeepSeek V3 with MTP tries to predict multiple words at once. So it's looking ahead, like it's trying to anticipate what's coming next. Precisely. It's kind of like when you're talking to someone and you can almost guess what they're going to say next. Yeah, I get that. So this ability to look ahead it improves its accuracy. It does, and it could also potentially speed up how fast it generates text overall. That's pretty impressive. So we have this massive model, super efficient, can predict multiple words at once. But how does it actually perform? Did they put it to the test? They sure did. They ran it through a whole bunch of benchmarks. Those are like standardized tests for AI. Right. And it aced them, especially when it came to code and math. It's even holding its own against, you know, the big names out there like GPT-4. Hold on. It's competing with GPT-4. That's a high bar. It is, and it's doing incredibly well, especially when it comes to code. What do you mean? It's really good at understanding and generating different kinds of code. Imagine having a coding buddy that can understand what you're doing and write new code based on your instructions. Okay, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. and what about handling, like, really long pieces of information? 
can it process long documents or have a really in-depth conversation without losing track of things? It can. It can handle up to 128,000 tokens, which is a ton of information. They even tested it with this task called needle in a haystack, and DeepSeek V3 managed to find the needle even when the haystack was massive. So it can find a needle in a digital haystack? It can. That gets into how it's designed, though. They've used this technique called... So it can find a needle in a digital haystack? It can. That gets into how it's designed, though. They've used this technique called multi-head latent attention, or MLA. MLA, huh? Sounds familiar, like from school. It does, but basically it's like the model has a super efficient filing system. Yeah. It can sort through tons of information and find what it needs without getting bogged down. So it helps DeepSeek V3 stay organized and process information quickly. Exactly. But there's another piece to this, too. DeepSeek Mo. Deep seek what now? It's just their special way of implementing the mixture of experts architecture. Oh, right. MOE, the team of specialists. Exactly. Remember how we said each expert is specialized? Yeah. Well, they've gone even further with Deep Seek Mo. Further? How they have these finer grained experts that are even more focused on very specific tasks. So it's like specialists within the specialists. Yeah, kind of. Like they have an expert for every possible scenario. Wow, that's a lot of experts. It is, but it's not just about having a ton of them. It's about how you manage them. Right, and that brings us back to that auxiliary loss-free load balancing, right? The AI project manager. You got it. It keeps all those experts running smoothly, no burnout, maximum efficiency. It all sounds very impressive but also very complex. It is, yeah. but that's what makes it so cool. Okay, back to multi-token prediction for a sec. MTP? Sure. It sounds very, well, complex. It is a bit, but I'll try to keep it simple. Okay, thanks. Imagine you're writing a sentence. Okay. Most language models, they predict one word at a time. Right. But DeepSeek V3 with MTP, it's trying to predict several words at once. So it's not just looking at what came before, it's also looking at what comes after. Yes. Yeah. And this ability to predict multiple tokens, it's done through this sequential prediction process. Sequential, like one after the other. Exactly. Each word builds on the one before it. And during training, it gets feedback on its predictions and learns from its mistakes. So it's constantly learning and getting better. Yep. And that's how it improves its accuracy. Right, but you also said it could speed up text generation. Oh, yeah, that too. So those MTP modules it uses in training, they can actually be discarded during inference, which is when you're actually using the model. So they're not needed once the training's done. Exactly, and that makes the whole thing run more efficiently. But here's the cool part. There's more. Those MTP modules can be repurposed for something called speculative decoding. Speculative decoding. Okay, now you've lost me. It's like giving the model a head start. It can use those MTP modules to predict several possible continuations and then choose the best one based on the context. So it's pre-computing some possibilities, making it faster. You got it. It's all about efficiency. Okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. So we've talked about the algorithms, but what about the actual infrastructure? The hardware running this thing. Ah, uh, yes, the hardware. That's important too. I bet it takes a lot of computing power to run something like DeepSeek V3. It does. They trained it on a cluster of 2048 NVIDIA H800 GPUs. 248 GPUs. That's insane. Those are some of the most powerful GPUs out there, right? They are. And coordinating all these GPUs, that's not easy. Yeah, I can imagine. That's why they developed this framework called Dual Pipe. Dual Pipe? What's that? It uses something called pipeline parallelism to divide the model into stages, and each stage is processed by a different group of GPUs. So it's like an assembly line. Each group works on a specific part of the model. Exactly. And they've optimized how these different stages talk to each other to make the whole thing super efficient. Wow, that's really clever. But what about memory? With all those parameters, it must take a ton of memory to store everything. You're right, memory is a big challenge. But they've done some really smart things to save memory. Like what? Well, for example, they recompute certain operations during training instead of storing the results. So they're trading a bit of extra computation for less memory usage. Exactly. It's a trade-off, but it works well. And for the model weights, they use this technique called exponential moving average. Exponential moving average. It's a way to track how the model is doing during training without having to store a full copy of the weights all the time. So more memory savings. Right. And all these tricks help to make DeepSeek V3 more feasible to train. I can imagine. But even with all these optimizations, training a model this big must still be super expensive. It's definitely not cheap. But they've managed to reduce the cost significantly. 
How? Well, remember FT8. The efficient number format. Yep, that's the one. By using FP8 for most of the computations, they've reduced the cost dramatically. So it's like switching from a gas guzzler to a fuel-efficient car. Same performance, but way cheaper to run. A perfect analogy. They've also implemented some techniques to compress and store the data more efficiently. Okay, so they're really squeezing every last bit of performance out of the system while also being mindful of costs. It's a balancing act. It sounds like it. But it's not just about the hardware and the algorithms, right? The data used to train the model is also crucial. Oh, absolutely. The data is like the fuel for the AI engine. So what do they feed this beast? A whopping 14.8 trillion tokens. 14.8 trillion? Where did they even get that much data? They've collected text from all sorts of sources like Wikipedia, GitHub, and a special data set called DM Mathematics. DM Mathematics. Sounds intense. It is. It's all about math problems and solutions. So they're giving it a broad range of information to learn from. Exactly. But it's not just about quantity, it's about quality, too. They've refined their data processing pipeline to make sure the data is clean and organized. So they're not just throwing any old text at it. They're carefully curating it to make sure it's top-notch. You got it. And they've even implemented this technique called fill-in-the-middle during pre-training. Fill-in-the-middle, like a word puzzle. Exactly. They give the model a sentence with some words missing, and it has to figure out what goes in the blanks. So they're making it work for its knowledge. Yep. It helps the model to really understand the relationships between words and how language works. Wow, they've really thought of everything. They have. They even modified the tokenizer, which is the thing that breaks down text into smaller units, to handle multiple languages better. So it's not just limited to English. Nope. It can handle all sorts of languages. That's amazing. So we've talked about the data, the algorithms, the hardware. What about the actual architecture of the model? The nitty-gritty details. Oh, yeah, we can definitely get into that. DeepSeq V3 has 61 transformer layers. 61 layers? That's a lot. It is. And each layer is like a processing step, refining the information from the previous layer. Like a signal being amplified and clarified. A great analogy. And they've set the hidden dimension to 7,168. Okay. And remind me, what does the hidden dimension do again? It's basically the size of the workspace the model has to process information. The bigger the hidden dimension, the more nuance it can capture. So 7,168, that's a pretty big workspace. It is. It allows DeepSeq V3 to understand really complex relationships between words and concepts. Makes sense. And they've also done some interesting things with the multi-head latent attention and mixture of experts components, right? They have. For the MLA, they've carefully tuned the number of attention heads and the dimensions. Tuned them? Yeah, it's like fine-tuning the settings on a microscope to get the perfect level of detail. I like that analogy. And for the MOE layers, they've actually replaced almost all of the traditional feedforward networks with these special MOE layers. So even more experts. Exactly. Each MOE layer has one shared expert and 256 routed experts. 256 routed experts per layer. That's a lot of routing. It is. But they've got some clever tricks to keep it all running smoothly, like limiting how many experts are active at once and controlling how they communicate. So it's like they've built this intricate network of experts, but they've also put in place all these rules and regulations to keep things from getting out of control. Exactly. It's a delicate balance. I can imagine. So what about multi-token prediction? How do they integrate that into the architecture? Oh, right. They set the depth of the MTP module to one. One. Yeah, it means that the model predicts not only the next token, but also one additional token ahead. So it's like double checking its work, making sure it's really understanding the context. You got it. And the end result of all this, DeepSeq V3 has a staggering 671 billion parameters. Uh oh, that's like an astronomical number. It is. But remember, only about 37 billion are active at any given time. Right. The selective activation. That's how they keep it efficient. Exactly. Now, are you ready for the really fun part? The training process. Bring it on. I want to hear all about the magic they use to train this beast. Bring it on. I want to hear all about the magic they use to train this beast. I bet it's complicated. It is, but it's also really fascinating. They used a mix of classic techniques and some clever new tricks. For optimization, they went with Adam W. Adam W, is that like a person? It's a popular algorithm for training large language models. Okay, got it. And they used a cosine decay schedule for the learning rate. Cosine decay. Sounds a bit like math class. It is. Yeah. But basically, it means they started with a higher learning rate and then gradually decreased it as training progressed. So, like, 
starting with big steps and then taking smaller and smaller steps as you get closer to your goal. Exactly. And they also use some techniques to prevent overfitting. Overfitting. It's when a model learns the training data too well and doesn't generalize well to new data. So it's like memorizing the answers instead of understanding the concepts. You got it. To prevent that, they use things like weight decay and gradient clipping. So it's not just blindly copying the training data. It's actually learning the underlying patterns and relationships. Precisely. And they used gradient accumulation to simulate larger batch sizes, which makes training more stable. Oh, and we can't forget about mixed precision training with FP8. Right. We talked about that earlier. It really speeds things up. So a lot of different techniques all working together. That sounds like it. So how long did it actually take to train this thing? To train on a trillion tokens takes roughly 180,000 GPU hours on their cluster. Okay, and how long is that in, like, human time? About 3.7 days. Less than a week to process a trillion tokens. That's insane. It is pretty amazing. And on top of all that, they extended the context window to handle even longer sequences of text. Oh, right, the context window. That's how much information the model can keep in mind at once, right? Exactly. They used a technique called YARN to expand it from 4,000 tokens to 128,000 tokens. 128,000. That's incredible. It's like giving the model a whole book to read yeah. and expecting to remember every detail. It's pretty impressive. This expanded context is really important for things like understanding long documents or having more in-depth conversations. Okay, so we've built this powerful, efficient, and long context model. But how do we know it actually works? Time for testing. They put DeepSeq V3 through a battery of benchmarks. Benchmarks. Think of them like standardized tests for AI. They cover everything from code generation to math problem solving to even things like standardized exams. So it's like the AI Olympics. How did DeepSeq V3 do? It aced them. It did incredibly well on tests like Human Evil for code generation and GSM 8K for math. It even outperformed some of the big names out there, including some closed source models. Wow. So it's not just a good open source model, it's a top contender overall. Exactly. They even did these things called ablation studies to see how each component of the model contributes to its performance. Ablation studies. Sounds intense. They basically removed different parts of the model to see how it affected the results. So they were trying to break it to see how it worked? Pretty much. And they found that things like the multi-token prediction and the load balancing strategy were really important for its success. Fascinating. So DeepSeq V3 is powerful, efficient, open source and it actually works. What does it all mean? What's the takeaway for our listener? It means that the landscape of AI is changing. Powerful models like DeepSeq V3 are becoming more accessible and are pushing the boundaries of what's possible. It's an exciting time to be involved in AI. It really is. I'm still a bit mind blown by everything we've talked about today. Thanks for walking me through it all. My pleasure. And hey, who knows what the future holds for DeepSeq V3 and open source AI in general. It's going to be fun to watch it all unfold. I can't wait to see what people do with it. It's like having a powerful new tool and the possibilities are endless. So to our listeners out there, if you want to learn more about DeepSeq V3, we'll have links to the research paper and other resources in the show notes. Keep exploring, keep learning, and keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Until next time.